I dove into Morse's writings. Um, didn't get to read everything because she did publish, um, what is it, 16 books, two plays, and <laughs> countless articles and stories over her career. So my hope is to reflect that fullness in today's selections and the mix will cover a variety of subjects, um, all of which have the through line of her passion and intensity and some of which do explicitly deal with the question of what it means to be a woman in the world that she was living in. Best of all, it is a house comfortable for a woman to work in. I like to live in an old house. I like the careful, leisurely workmanship of a former day, the patina which comes only with time, the golden dimness that the years lay across a well-constructed dwelling. Above all, give me a house whose work I can do myself if need be. In a house of a shape and size where I can do my own work, I am insured against fate. No home means home to me that must have paid service. A house where you must necessarily be overworked and uncomfortable if you cannot find someone to do your work for you. I stayed in my house just long enough to get work done. No sooner was my work finished than we were out in the boat or swiftly sneaker footed over small trails across the dunes for a swim on the outside shore. Or we would take our supper across and have it on the outside beach with Captain Cook at Peaked Hill Bars. I knew that I would never be quite so happy again. For a moment, a few brief weeks, I had recaptured the happiness I had as a girl. And yet I had the freedom of a woman. I had my house and my children and yet I had the gaiety that comes only as a rule with the irresponsibility of youth. <laughs> People who have never seen an industrial struggle think of a strike as a time of turmoil, disorder, and riot. Nothing could be less true. A good strike is a college for the workers. When the workers listen to the speeches, they are going to school. Their minds are being opened. They are learning history and economics translated into the terms of their own lives. Many of them suddenly find hitherto unsuspected powers. Men and women, until now dumb, get up on platforms and speak with fire and let the eloquence of sincerity to their fellow workers. Others write article leaflets. New forms of demonstration are invented and the workers set off singing the songs they themselves have made up under the pressure of the strike. Like new blood, these new talents flow through the masses of the workers. Lawrence was a singing strike. The workers sang everywhere, at the picket line, at the soup kitchens, at the relief stations, at the strike meetings. Always there was singing. In many different places over the United States, workers' songs have been written and sung. Many of them are anonymous. Other songwriters stand out, like Ella Mae Wiggins of Gastonia, who was shot and killed during the strike in 1929, and Aunt Molly Jackson of Kentucky, whose songs will be sung as long as there are minors. In Lawrence, the excitement of achievement was everywhere. We found that men and women who until yesterday had known only the routine of the mill had worked out large size organizational jobs in the commissary, organizing relief, collecting and distributing food, running their own finances. The Lawrence strike had six stores and seven soup kitchens and maintained a large force of relief workers. The workers organized their mass demonstrations and mass amusements huge picnics and concerts. Overall, and including all the strike activities, was the sense that the other workers were with them. Most workers, especially the unorganized, lived isolated lives, spent between the job and the factory and a tenement home and the saloon. They knew only the people in their own department in the mill. Suddenly, in strike time, the working force became a unit. Workers realized that the mill was like a single person. Not only that, but the workers in all the many different mills who had never known each other, who at most had seen each other's faces hurrying past on the street, now under strike conditions, were united. All at once, they were living. 
marching, singing, listening to one mighty rhythm, the workers' solidarity. Their mass feeling had magnified their powers and lifted them above isolation and poverty. Not only were the workers united, but there was no moment of the strike when the workers were not conscious of the other workers throughout the country, whose eyes were fixed on their struggle. Strike funds arrived daily from other unions in the industry and other sympathetic unions. Delegations of workers came to visit. Speakers came, and for a moment in Lawrence, speakers, visitors, spectators, strikers, leaders were outside themselves, swept up out of their small personal existences into the larger and august flow of the strike. Something very good was being evolved here. People were thinking in unison. People were acting in unison, marching together, singing together. Harmony, not disorder, was being, dis being established yet it was a collective harmony. A meeting like this was the antithesis of mob, people coming together to build and create instead of to hate and destroy. What we saw in Lawrence affected us so profoundly that this moment of time in Lawrence changed life for us. Both Joe O'Brien and I had come along, come a long road to get to Lawrence. It was for us our point of intersection. Together we experienced the realization of the human cost of our industrial life. Something transforming had happened to both of us. We knew now where we belonged, on the side of the workers and not with the comfortable people among whom we were born. We knew, although at the time our personal lives seemed incidental, that we wanted to go on together and work together. Some synthesis had taken place between my life and that of the workers some peculiar change which would never again permit me to look with indifference on the fact that riches for the few were made by the misery of the many. It was in Lawrence that we realized what we must do, that we could make one contribution, that of writing the worker's story as long as we lived. We did not work this all out immediately, but a great and important change in the motivation of our lives had occurred. We realized too, that all the laws made for the betterment of workers' lives have their origin with the workers. Hours are shortened, wages go up, conditions are better, only if the workers protest. We wanted to work with them and write about them. We wanted to break through the silence and isolation which surrounded the workers' lives until everyone understood the conditions under which cloth was made as we had been made aware. I have tried to account for what happened to us both in Lawrence. The sense of indignation which we shared was not the whole story. It was far more complex than that. It was seeing of what beauty human beings are capable. Here in Lawrence was the flame, that surging forward toward the light, which is the distinction of mankind. That striving for light appears in many different forms. It has demanded religious freedom, freedom of scientific thought, political freedom, in our generation, it is striving towards economic justice. It is this that sings our songs, makes the art and discoveries of a race, and shakes off age-old tyrannies. The flame ebbs, it fluctuates, it never goes out. It appears now in a Steinmetz or an Einstein, now in the spontaneous uprising of the textile workers in Lawrence, now in the great paintings of Rivera and Orozco. In this flame resides the genius of a people. It is this flame that leads forlorn hopes, that wins victories against incredible odds. Faith, courage, and beauty are its texture. When people are gathered together, when the individual is forgotten for the collective good, there is this quickening. Suddenly the aspirations of once anonymous lonely people who have come together form the flame. In March, the strike was settled with a sliding scale of from 10% to 5%, 10% going to those least paid. It meant 60 or 70 cents more a week in pay envelopes. The strike cost 1125000 according to the New York World. The militia had cost the taxpayers 125000 but the workers' payrolls had been raised $6 million throughout New England, and thousands of workers were affected, besides the victorious Lawrence strikers. 23 years have passed since the Lawrence strike. Empires have fallen, yet the injustices in the textile industry which made that strike in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1912 are in broad outlines as true today as they were then. 
except that today we have the added horror of the speed up. 23 years have passed, and it is still true that, as Ray Stannard Baker then pointed out, industrially, we have arrived at the state of the Central American Republics politically, a government of successive revolutions. A friend of mine summed up my life. He said, you have failed in the two main objects for which you've lived. You have failed in bringing up your children. You have failed in your work. What's the matter with my children? They love me, don't they? I challenged. You've no discipline. You can't even keep them out of your room when you're working. Do you suppose that a man would stand for that? <laughs> you're blind if you can't see that they hate your work. This brought me up short. It threw a searchlight on what had been happening between my children and me. I realized with what intensity one of my children hated my work. All her life, nurses and relatives had said to her, you can't see your mother, she's working. Now she was old enough to assume some household authority. She had an excuse for interrupting me with everything and nothing. Nor could anything I said or did stop her. I hadn't understood it. I hadn't seen she was revenging herself on the past when she wanted her mother. It was her profound unconscious revolt against the hated writing which had kept her which had kept her from me when she needed me all her life and I hadn't understood. She had come into her own and showed her first fierce resentment against the thwarting of her in, inalienable right to bring her hurts and troubles to her mother. Because I was so hurt, I threw defiantly at my friend, I've earned their living anyway. Oh, yes, you've earned their living, my friend agreed, but you've never done the best work of which you were capable, as a man would have insisted on doing. Mm -hmm. I could agree with him about my work. The world would have wagged along without my books. My story wouldn't be important if it were the story of one woman. My failure is that of almost every working woman who has children and a home to keep up, whether she scrubs floors or works in mills or is a high-priced professional woman. It's nearly impossible to do both jobs well. So most women fail in either or both. Their energy and thoughts are divided. These things flash through my mind with terrible corroboration when my friend said, you failed as a mother. I knew far more than he did how much my failure was my own fault. He thought that a woman couldn't do two jobs and I and the children were caught in a set of circumstance since I had to support them. I had other guilty knowledge. I've always told myself that I began writing because I wanted to earn money so my husband would have more time for his own stories. Later, life said to me, earn your children's living. Life says to some women, scrub, go to the factory, to others life dictates, take an office job, go into business if you want your children to be educated. And women flock out of their homes, they have to. Most of us are failures as mothers, so this is no back to the home story. There would often be no home if women didn't go out to work. Mm. There is another phase of my writing that no one knows about but myself. I grew ambitious. Writing got me. I wanted to do good work for its own sake. From that moment I was lost. I had fallen in love. I had surrendered myself to something outside myself. There could be no more comfortable days when I could think I was writing only because this was an honorable way of supporting my children. From that time, I wouldn't have stopped if I could. Maybe my failure began then. I know very well from that moment, I found plausible reasons for leaving home to do work. The truth was I lusted for new experiences and new forms of work. Now, instead of merely being absent behind closed doors, I was really away, and I liked being away. The, relent the relentless details which all women must meet if they would see their houses run well slipped from me like a burden. Since then I have kept on finding excuses which, have, which made me leave the children and which would give me the most material and the best chance to write. We can always find, find noble reasons for what we want to do. Yes, I am a woman who likes the affairs of the house. Sorry. <clears throat> Yet I am a woman who likes the affairs of the house. I am never at war with it except when it interferes with my work, and so interferes with its own existence, since without money I could have no house. I know I, I needed to go away as much as I know my children needed me home. It sounds like a paradox to say I found peace in constant traveling, 
which I hadn't known in my quiet house, because at home there was a never-ending conflict between my two jobs. I had been faithful to my house and its demands so many years. Don't housewives deserve a sabbatical year? <laughs> I am sure that all women with imagination, however much they care about their families, however content they are with their work, turn longing eyes to the road that leads to new places. They crave the experience of adventure as much as a man. I am not satisfied with my sabbatical year. I am deeply impatient, almost all, almost for the first time, as the interruptions which my children naturally make. I am indignant at an interruption, now that I have known what it is to be interrupted, as a man would be if his work were held in light esteem. Mm. I have felt as men must feel when they know their wives are sitting waiting to welcome them affectionately. I don't even want the affection of my children when I'm through work. All I want is to be left alone. I often dread to leave my workroom to meet their never ceasing demands. They seem to me like a nest full of birds, their yellow beaks forever agape for me to fill. <laughs> Is there any mother who wouldn't escape from the relentless persistency of her children for a while if she could? One thing all women want, love, a home, children. They may find a terrible conflict between this basic need and the passionate desire for independence. Who will make the adjustment? Women are going to go on working. They have to. They want to. I know I would go on working whether I needed to or not. I have never wanted to write as much as I do now. On the other hand, I have never realized my children's needs so clearly and have never wanted so much to fill them. Are the two things possible? Must there always be a double failure? <laughs>
that of revenge and self-protection as exposed by Samuel S. Leibowitz, attorney for the defense, could reach the ears of the jury. A white man had accused a black man, and he already was condemned. The jury listened as impassive as they were attentive until the summation of Wade Wright. He is a big, heavy man, dark and florid. He made a speech which appealed to every race and sectional prejudice of the audience and the jury. No Alabama jury will believe a witness bought with Jew money from New York, he shouted. No, they won't. No, murmured the audience. Wade Wright grew purple in his face. He bent towards the jury. They leaned towards him. He spoke their language. He was saying what they wanted to hear. This Carter, he cried, has been supported by Brodsky. His name will soon be Carterevsky, and he'll have a hump from carrying a Jew pack. The courtroom swayed to his words. There had been a rapport between him and the jury. There, had, there was between them a dark understanding of blood. He wanted to burn the black boy sitting there, and their desires and hatred flowed together while he, sweat running down his face, shouted his condemnation of the defendants, of the defendant, of the witnesses for the defense, of the northern lawyers, and especially of Joseph Brodsky of the International Labor Defense. He openly accused Brodsky of buying two of the principal defense witnesses. Samuel S. Leibowitz, chief counsel for the defense, moved for a mistrial. This trial won't be worth a pinch of snuff from now on, he cried. The fair-minded judge, Edward E. Horton, wore a face of suffering. He had kept down the mounting race hatred which, from the first, had enveloped this trial. His judicial fairness, his open-mindedness, his passionate desire to see truth, to see true justice done, had kept down mob violence. Now, at the word of Wade Wright, the crowd's emotion welled out like a punctured boil. There were there have been several small mobs which have formed only to be dispersed by the sheriff and the militia. Threats were openly made against Brodsky's life and that of the other defendant's lawyers. Fiery crosses were burned in Huntsville and in Scottsboro. One of the sights in Alice Marcy's life, which seemed to her to have increased with greater and greater frequency, was that of her son Robert, sailing rapidly over the Earth's surface like some swift hydroplane with other of his companions, while Sarah, like a poor little inefficient row rowing boat, frantically followed in their wake, and upon their having achieved a far horizon, roars would issue from the mouth of Sarah. Alice had a theory that little boys and little girls play the same games if they are brought up naturally together. For the most part, Sarah shared this opinion of her mother's. She shared it strongly. She shared it vociferously. <laughs> it was Robert who differed from the opinion of the ladies of his family. He was very decided on this matter. He put it this way, fellows don't want a girl forever hanging around and always yelling. I can run just as fast as lots of you, said Sarah. I can run faster than Shinny Allen. I can run faster than Mud Morse. <laughs> I know you can, responded her brother gloomily. That's what makes it so rotten. We'd get away oftener if you couldn't. <laughs> lots and lots of things I can do as well as any boy, said Sarah with rapidly rising temper. Yes, and the fellows make fun of you, her disgusted brother answered. Whenever there's a crowd of boys around, what do you suppose she wants to do? Show them how she can stand on her head. <laughs> they like to have me, said Sarah. Mud gave me a piece of toffee for showing him how. I don't like to see you, responded her brother. You look like a donkey, and when you're done, you look like this. He put his head on one side and mimicked his sister's engaging smile. It was in that unfortunate mood that Alice undertook to explain to her son the virtues of tomboys. Did he want a weak, effeminate sister who later on would be no companion to him, she inquired. I don't want to punch the nose of every fellow who calls her a tomboy, he responded. She's awfully unobliging, too. She won't be he when you ask her to. Why should I be he all the time, Robert Marcy, his sister asked with the same temper. They want me to be he every single time, just because I'm a girl. Here her lips quivered and beautiful tears trembled in her eyes. Half the time they want me to be he and shut my eyes and count. 
And after 100 or 150, excuse me, they run away and leave me. Is that fair? Would you call that a kind brother? The wrongs of womanhood overwhelmed her and she wept. Tom Marcy came to what he would have called the rescue. Sarah, he said, has got to have exercise. On the other hand, you can't let her butt in on the boys if they don't want her. I'm going to put up a swing for Sarah and it'll be hers for certain hours. At those times, the boys can't come near it. The swing proved a great success. At first, Sarah and her little friends who gathered from neighboring houses used it for the legitimate purpose of swings. That is to say, for swinging. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, it became a tea table and doll's dishes were spread upon it. With the advent of the swing and its attendant amusements, Sarah seemed to have forgotten boys and all their works. Then occurred a surprising thing. The boys who always swarmed over the Marcy Place diminished in numbers. Apparently, the sight of the swing, the denied paradise, was too much for them. They preferred to pursue their occupations elsewhere. Only a few jealous souls remained, and these cried to the girls alluringly, words which had never passed their lips in their lives before. Come on and play cops and robbers with us. Come on and play marbles. Come on, you can use our scooters. <laughs> to all this, Sarah, as spokesman, replied primly, we're playing the way my father told us to. We don't want to play those games. Pressure was brought to bear. A boy threw a horse chestnut, which hit a doll on the head. <laughs> Upon this, Sarah, puffed up with virtue, approached her mother. Mother, she said, do we have to play with the boys if we don't want to? Certainly not, replied Alice. Well, said Robert in an aggrieved tone, I want to know why we can't play with you. We're playing grown-up games, Sarah gave back grandly. In grown-up games, aren't there school teachers and aren't there fathers, Robert wanted to know? Yes, Sarah replied, with that awful logic of childhood. In grown-up games, they have those things, but we don't need to have them. We're only playing. We don't need you. You wait for your turn, and then you can have the swing, she said with maddening condescension. This was the crux of it. They didn't need the boys anymore. Not needing them, they didn't want them. And the boys, those free spirits, forever escaping from the clutches of small girl animals, resented the state of things. Ah, oh, come on, the proud Robert was heard to beseech. Just let us play with you a little. No, we won't, Robert Marcy, responded his sister. When you play with us, you hurt us. You break things. You make everything dirty. You want everything your own way. She appealed to her mother again. Why should we let Robert in when we're having a good time like we are? And anyway, father said we don't have to. Perhaps Alice Marcy had the germs of feminism in her. Who can tell? Maybe instead of being a feminist, she had a sense of humor. <laughs> At any rate, her response was, no, darling, they don't need to play with you until you want them to. Well, we don't want them to, was Sarah's <laughs> pronouncement. We like it this way. Now we're happy. Then we wouldn't be. They make fun of our dolls. They take the swing away from us. There spoke a bitter knowledge. Tell them to go away, mother. Watching the crestfallen boys, Alice softened somewhat. A few boys and girls could play together without quarreling, she began, but Sarah cut her short. We can't. How can we? They knock us about. They want everything. <laughs> With this brief, comprehensive word, she returned to her playmates and Alice went into the house. Realizing that Sarah had attained what women the world over apparently are striving to attain. Spiritual independence and the means of being self-sustainable.